Psalm 139, verses 1 through 12. For you have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in, behind, and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. What can I, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me, and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. Psalms 139, 23, and 24. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. As we begin today, we're going to be in Romans 8 again, a continuation from last week's Walking with the Spirit. Uh, today, the title is Walking with Hope. It is a joy to be able to share this message with each. Uh, and that as we begin, uh, let's talk and ask God for his uh, input into today's message. Loving Father, we thank you uh, for Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit as you move and, and live in us. And we thank you for your presence and we ask that you would take today's message that you would speak into our hearts that we can uh, understand this walking with hope and what is said in Romans 8 is so pivotal pivotal to the uh, message of the entire gospel and God we thank you for all that you do and we ask that you would bless today in Christ's name, amen. What comes to mind when you think of hope? The word hope. Now, I have a, a, a personal story I want to share a little bit. You've heard me talk about uh, how fond and how much uh, I loved my grandfather. And when I was a young child, uh, he remarried to a lady, and her name was Hope. And Hope was a very hard person. She was uh, hard to get uh, be around and hard to relate to. She was uh, she loved my grandfather, and and but it was a tough situation. But as years went by, when we had our girls. We felt it was very important that they would call her Grandma Hope. And you cannot believe the transformation in this woman when my uh, Jennifer and Julie would refer to her as Grandma Hope. So when I think of Hope, I that story comes to mind. This lady, the, the transformation in just the, the simple referring to her as Grandma. And it was a relationship and a family. But... That's a sidebar to, the, to this, hope. And the definition, I'm gonna give you four, and I want you to think about all four because as this message plays out today, there's components of all four throughout uh, this section of Romans. It's a feeling of expectation and desire for a particular thing to happen. That's a hope. And I think we can all relate to that. Number two, a person or thing that may help or save someone. We hope this will happen. We hope this person can come. And I hope you put that in perspective, perspective of a person or thing that will come, and that is Jesus. 
uh, as we think about the scriptures. Number three, grounds for believing that something good may happen. We hope for a positive outcome. And the fourth one is a feeling of trust. What it comes down to is hope is very powerful. It is something that we probably put more emphasis on than we realize as we go through life, as we think of things. Hope is a part of our life probably every day. We're going to go back and pick up uh, where we left off in Romans today. We will begin in Romans 8 verses 12 through 25. We're going to look at three takeaways from this passage. Today, uh, I chose to use the Passion Translation as the way to read these verses. I would encourage you, if you have uh, different translations, to read it and see what is said. There is so much in this. The first takeaway, our choices don't have to come from our human selfishness. Verse 12, so then, beloved ones, the flesh has no claims on us at all. And we have no further obligation to live in obedience to it. For when, we, for when you live controlled by the flesh, you are about to die. But if the life of the spirit puts to death the corrupt ways of the flesh, we then taste his abundant life. We can trust the Holy Spirit. The fourth definition was trust, hope. When we follow the new commandment to love as Jesus loves, we view people differently. Have you ever stopped and asked God to help you with someone that you did not love and they, in all definitions, were unlovable? You know, they, they, certainly life was out the question, but how to love them? Have you gone to God and asked him to help you see and love this person as he does, as he loves them. And have you felt your heart change? Have you experienced a change? Maybe not immediate, but over time. We pay closer attention to how our responses, words, and actions affect others. When we include Jesus in our relationships, when we re include Jesus in, especially those times when we don't, connect with somebody. Calling my grandfather's wife, grandma, was transforming. And it was a simple thing, but it came from God. I am convinced of that. When, you when we follow the lead of the Holy Spirit, who will help us choose a more loving path? You ever thought of that? that when we include God, he is giving us a more uh, moving and loving path, walking in hope. Think about those definitions, expectation. Someone is coming to change and we can believe that it's going to happen and we can trust that it will happen. The second takeaway, our relationships with God enables us to choose wisely. Begin in verse 4 from Romans 8. The mature children of God are those who are moved by the impulses of the Holy Spirit. And you did not receive the spirit of religious duty, leading you back into the fear of never being good enough but you have received the spirit of full acceptance, enfolding you into the family of God, and you will never feel orphaned, for as he rises up within us, our spirits join him in saying the words of tender affection, beloved Father, 
Many translations call this Abba, Father, tender, loving. That's the God we serve. That's the God that says, I want you to be in my family. That is the God that Jesus came and made the path available to us. Loving, tender, and kind. Verse 16, for the Holy Spirit makes God's fatherhood real to us as he whispers into our innermost being. You are God's beloved child. And since we are his true children, we qualify to share all his treasures. For indeed, we are heirs of God himself. And since we are joined to Christ, we also inherit all that he is and all that he has. We will experience being co-glorified with him, provided that we accept his sufferings as our own. I am convinced that any suffering we endure is less than nothing compared to the magnitude of the glory that is about to be unveiled within us. There's a lot of hope in that sentence and those two verses, three verses. Jesus suffered. An example of that, that and I really, I really feel God put it on my heart because it would not go away. And I reflected on this every day. And it just it kept coming back and coming back. Jesus is all about relationships. We've studied and we've talked about this uh, over months and years about how important relationships are and how important Jesus wants to have a relationship with each of us. But as I was going through this, I got to thinking about the relationship he had with the, the 12. He had spent three and a half years daily with these, in, these men. And they got to know each other very well. And the relationship had to be very strong. But at the end, they all denied him. Having a relationship go south sour is one thing but to be denied to to actually just destroy that relationship and i know many have, have experienced either through a divorce or uh, one thing or another but when you've had a relationship come unraveled around you and it's over it hurts and that's a, that's a suffering that I guess I really never thought about when I thought about Jesus suffering. I, you know, as a human on earth, he took on the pains and, and the agony and, and the sufferings, but the loss of that relationship with his disciples had to be incredibly uh, powerful. But what is interesting is even in the midst of all of that, Jesus was never left alone. God always was there for him. Through the Spirit, there was never a time that he was alone. And that is true for us. There's never a time that we're left alone. So as Jesus suffered, are we willing to suffer also? We have been adopted. We're a part of the family. And chosen by the Father through the Son. We don't have to succumb to our selfish and fearful tendencies. We don't have to look at our own self and, and react the way that we maybe always have. Ask the Holy Spirit to walk you through, to help you make those changes. And make those changes consistent. And they are a part of your, the new you. The spirit in us helps us choose differently and affirms our relationship with God. The spirit moving in us is a reality. Jesus suffered when he chose love over hate. And we may also. 
choosing love over hate. Think about that as we think of our society and our world, our country right now. Choosing love over hate will ultimately bring glory to both God and us. There's a hope, there's an expectation that that will happen. What would our world look like? Our country, our state, your neighborhood, if we chose love over hate. In every aspect, think of, would the protests continue? Would there be people being hurt, set up, killed? No. But it begins in our home. Love over hate. It starts where we live, in our hearts. Another takeaway, we are connected with each other and that connection impacts creation. In verse 19, the entire universe is standing on tiptoe, yearning to see the unveiling of God's glorious sons and daughters. For against its will, the universe itself has had to endure the empty futility resulting from that consequences of human sin. For now, but now, with eager expectation, all creation longs for freedom from its slavery to decay, to experience with us the wonderful freedom coming to God's children. We see this every day. If we're watching, if we're letting the Spirit lead us, we believe that that creation is longing. When we see all of the ills that are happening, is that an evidence of happiness or is that an evidence of things need to change? Verse 22, to this day, we are aware of the universal agony and groaning of creation as if it were the contractions of labor of childbirth. Now, I'm going to intersect here, uh, inject a, a personal memory. I was there for both of my girls at birth. And I can tell you it was painful. But I can't express how my wife would talk about that. But if you've ever watched or been around uh, when a uh, birth happens, there is incredible pain and agony. But when that child is handed to the mother, there is such a transformation of love and you don't see pain. You see un unparalleled joy and happiness in that moment. We think of creation in, in waiting, the expectation. We're, we're in those, those labor pains right now and have been since uh, the garden, waiting for the, the true coming of what creation was created to be. In verse 23, and it's not just creation, we who have already experienced the first fruits of the Spirit also inwardly groan as we passionately long to experience our full status as God's sons and daughters, including our physical bodies being transformed. That verse is full of hope. We are walking and looking and waiting, passionately waiting for the return of Jesus to restore creation to its beginning. Creation waits for us to fully embrace the new commandment, to love others as Jesus loves us. A way of love that is led by the Holy Spirit. Our love for others impacts creation. 
from a physical aspect, we don't overfish the seas. We don't deforest the landscape. We don't pollute the waters because of our love and concern for others. What we do and how we treat each other matters. And I think we've heard a lot about what matters and what doesn't matter, but what we do and how we treat others does matter. Hope gives us patience, endurance. In verse 24, for this is the hope of our salvation. But hope means that we must trust and wait for what is still unseen. For why would we need to hope for something we already have? So because our hope is set on what is yet to be seen, we patiently keep on waiting for its fulfillment. And we do look to that fulfillment. We are praying and asking for that fulfillment every day. Know that you are chosen and loved by God, and this truth undergirds your life. Is that a part of the stability of your inner being that you are chosen and loved by God. It is unchanged by your circumstances. Have you ever thought of that? No matter what you do, how you react, you are loved by God. Your health, your relationships, and your struggles, those circumstances do not change God's perspective of you. God is for you and wants you to believe that you are never alone because you're not. You will never be alone. No matter what situation you find yourself in, and there's times that it feels like you're there by yourself, reach out to God and he will show you how unalone you are. Galatians 5 and verse 1, let me be clear, the anointed one has set us free, not partially, but completely and wonderfully free. We must always cherish this truth and stubbornly refuse to go back into the bondage of our past. The enemy would love for us to go back and to embrace the past, that bondage that we were captive of. But Jesus says, I'm here and I'm for you and it's okay. Accept life's pattern of loss and renewal. Everyone endures seasoning, seasons of suffering and we all do. And you may be in the middle of that season right now. Rest assured if you're not, one's coming. But we also experience love, beauty, and joy. Sometimes if we're paying attention, we will find love, beauty, and joy in the midst of great sufferings. That love is the presence of God, affirming that we are never alone. Even Jesus suffered but as we know from scripture, he was never alone. Actively look for evidence of God's presence in your life. Make that maybe the, where you begin, as you begin your daily prayer, ask God to show you his presence that day. While we might think that evidence of God's presence should look like a miracle where our problems are removed, or our situations are healed. Boy, that, that's an awesome thing to think about, isn't it? Problems removed and we're completely healed. That's maybe how we pray and we are hopeful for. Often, God's presence appears in small ways. The kindness of a stranger reaching out to people that park their car outside your home, showing kindness to a stranger, a call from a friend. 
I received that from my friend in Texas that's suffering from cancer. An incredible blessing. A sense of comfort and peace can come about because it comes from God. The evidence is no less impressive despite its lack of pizzazz, of, of wonderment. If it's from God, it's, it is awesome. In fact, developing an awareness of God's presence transforms us and deepens our relationship with God much more than an instantaneous miracle ever would. And you think, well, maybe I'm the exception. Remember how quickly the Israelites forgot how God parted the Red Sea? And if you walked through that Red Sea on dry ground, and it didn't take long before that was a distant memory. Your position of being chosen is not reduced or diminished by the suffering you experience as a human being in this world. Jesus' example of suffering helps us understand how we can approach pain in this world by knowing as a deeply held truth, we know this to be true, that our loving God is with us through all of it. We're never alone. And I thought of the stories of the people that are in a COVID-19 ICU ward. Family can't join them. And the nursing staff have talked about they're the only human contact this person has. But what they don't realize is Jesus is always with us. We're never alone, no matter what the situation. We can go through life, good days, bad days, ups and downs, joys and sadness, knowing we are an adopted child of God. There is no hope we are. That is reality. We do every day, we are walking with hope. We hope for what is not seen, but what is reality. We wait with anticipation of life eternal with our loving triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. Thank you for joining us today. We would love to hear from you. We can be reached at our website at gcderby.org or our Facebook page at Grace Communion Derby. We thank you, Jesus, for being in our life and watch and care for us. Please watch over us this week. Amen. Thank you.